Hi, y'all. I want to know if you get extra credit for being way, 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 way back, because it's almost like you're in a new country. Are you in Rhode Island back there? But we want to say hi, Dia. I understand this, because I, too, am a back row person, and it, the view is just a little better back there. So, and if, and if I had the power vested within me, I'd give you all double chapel credits for being here in person today. I really would. And I would say, God bless you for being so brave and being out here on this windy day. My mother was an alien. Uh, you heard me correctly. My mother was a card-carrying bona fide alien. Uh, she entered the US legally, but she wasn't an American citizen. She had a green card and was considered a registered alien. I have these vivid childhood memories of going to the main post office in Quincy, Massachusetts. We kids would wait in the car. My parents would walk inside. My US Navy veteran father and my registered alien mother. Some mysterious magic happened within those granite doors and walls, and they'd come back out, they would emerge with a slip of paper, the deed was done. She was registered once again as an alien, and we go off and do our errands that day. It took my mom lots of years to learn a modicum of English and to learn factoids about American political system. But eventually she got her, her citizenship uh, rights and she got changed from being an alien to a citizen. Her actual cer ceremony was held in Faneuil Hall in Boston. She was there with 200 other people who were naturalized on the day, on the 4th of July on America's bicentennial year. She took an oath of allegiance. They all turned in their green cards. They received a certificate of naturalization, and they all got a small, waveable U.S. flag. They were declared at that point official U.S. citizens, and my mother, she was thrilled. She studied long and hard. She would say, my English, she not so good. George Washington, first president of United States, and all this sort of stuff, but she was thrilled. She passed the exam. She could vote. She wouldn't have to register each year at the post office. And over the decades, these terms have changed. You're now a lawful permanent resident or a permanent resident alien or a green card holder, but it all means the same sort of thing. The green card is good, but for most people, citizenship is better. So let me fast forward to today. What does my citizenship in America mean? What does it mean to be an American and a follower of Christ in today's broken, dysfunctional, so short on hope world? The repeated, tragic, violent, seemingly random deaths in our nation over these past four months have taken our national breath away. The horrific shootings of eight people, including six AAPI spa workers in Atlanta. The mass shooting in a supermarket in Boulder. The FedEx workers killed in Indianapolis. And even as the trial of George Floyd concluded and Derek Chauvin was convicted, we learned of the shooting of Dante Wright in Minnesota and heard of two teenagers in the Midwest, Adam Toledo and Makia Bryant, all killed by police officers. Anyone with a brain in their head has to ask, why? What for? How can we make sense of this pain and violence? What does true justice mean in these United States? And I have to confess to you, this mid-March shooting in Atlanta of Sung Chum Park Hong Jung Grant, Sung Cha Kim, Young A. Yu, Delana Ashley Yan, Paul Andre Michaels, Xiao Jie Tan, and Dao Yu Feng. It rocked me. Six of these eight people who were killed by a young man who attended a Christian church with his family. These folks were Korean and Chinese Americans. These women look like friends and relatives. These people were my people. They are my people. And I learned from the Stop AAPI hate group that nearly 3,800 incidents, mostly against AAPI women, have been reported in this pandemic year. And earlier this year, you and I saw videos of elderly AAPI people being mugged and robbed. And horrific, that horrific video of an 85-year-old man who was pushed from behind in San Francisco, Vichar Ratanapkanaki, who was pushed and fell to his death. I immediately thought of the AAPI women who've been fetishized here and abroad. And I thought of the trips I've gotten to take to Thailand, 
when I've seen older white men with much younger Asian women, women who look like they could be their granddaughters. It all feels so terribly, terribly wrong. And as this, circum, as this coronavirus circumnavigated this globe, I cringed and I would be filled with anger when our former president would use inaccurate and racially divisive terms like Kung flu or the China virus. And you add to this the murder of George Floyd on a street in Minneapolis, handcuffed, prone, hearing his pleas for mercy as he breathed his last, all captured on a cell phone video. And the response to his tragic death brought multi-ethnic, multi-generational people to the streets, some who protested peacefully and others not so much so. Pile on top of this an election year, which you've heard so many times has been like none other. And add to this shutdowns, physical distancing, mask wearing, virtual hybrid and in-person learning. And there you have it. You guys are gonna have a lot to tell your grandchildren someday. You're gonna be able to look along and say, Aaliyah, Olivia, when your Nana and Granddad were at Gordon College, there was this little software program we called Zoom. Well, the shooting deaths of six AAPI women in Atlanta was the turning point for me. I'm not black, I'm not brown, I'm an Asian American cisgender woman but I could no longer distance myself from this cultural moment. My younger Asian American Pacific Islander activist friends began to call out the fallacies of the model of minority myth. And we, well, I'm gonna speak really personally here. If truth be told, I've mostly believed the lie that because of my being adjacent to the dominant culture, I also belong to it. My AAPI status, my family's Horatia Alger-esque rags to riches story may be believed that the American narrative largely works for those who work hard and take advantage of opportunities. Sure, you sacrifice, but the kids at one point, they'll get their rewards. You know, they too will be able to have a big mortgage and a dog in the suburbs. But honestly, I didn't buy this story wholesale but I know I have not experienced the day-to-day -day pain and trauma of life in America that my black and brown sisters and brothers live. And I have to confess that too often, I've chosen to be quiet and to observe, and I haven't had the courage to speak up and to stand with my black brothers and brown, black and brown siblings in their time of need. So to my black and brown siblings who are listening, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I want to do better. I want to be braver in the spaces that I'm called out to live and serve in. These tragic shootings, the multiracial protests, the sense that our nation is so deeply, deeply divided has caused me to rethink my identity, both who I am and whose I am. And that's what I want to call us to think about today. Our Bible verse is Philippians 3.20. And it reads, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. I'd like us to really focus on this simple verse, our citizenship is in heaven because from this truth, God gives us a guiding star to help us navigate complex times, especially as we think about ourselves and our identity. In non-pandemic years, I get to travel globally as Grace Chapel's missions pastor, and I get to connect with mission partners all around the world and see what God is doing in and through them. And I know many of you have also traveled internationally, so you're familiar with the drill. You come back to, to Boston, you're exhausted after a long flight. There are hundreds and hundreds of you trying to rush through border control and customs because you know, everyone knows that on the other side of Terminal E at Logan, there's the promised land. The promised land, friends, family, Duncans, and a soft bed. And clearing customs and immigration is usually routine, unless the customs beagle catches you trying to bring in some kind of food treat that's considered contraband in your backpack. Not that that's ever happened to me. But you join in this line, this huge queue for US citizens and permanent residents. And you note that once again, you have this uncanny knack to choose the longest and slowest queue. 
Finally, you get to see the customs official. You give them their, their, um, your passport. They ask you some questions about where you've been, how long you've been away. And they slip your, mach your passport through this machine. And if it doesn't beep and whistles don't go off, they give you back your passport. And what do they say to you? They often smile at you, even Bostonians. And they say, welcome home. You're home. You're back in the USA. Well, similarly, Philippians 3.20 is God's welcome home verse to us, his children. When we've made the decision to follow Jesus, our citizenship status changes automatically. We become citizens of heaven. And this address change is not a temporary one. It's permanent. Our home is in heaven. This unseen world, the scripture teaches us, is our true home. And because we're citizens of heaven, kingdom citizens, we're not bound by the identity politics of the world. Good thing I have enough poundage on me to not blow away. So I hope the same for each of you. Tim Keller suggests that there are three identities particularly prevalent today that compete with the true identity offered by God uh, as citizens of heaven. And I want, as I read these, I want you to think if any of these identity politics might sound familiar to you. The first he suggests is called the therapeutic individualistic model. It says that when we look inside ourselves, we find our deepest desires and we say, this is me. I need to realize my desires. Another identity is that if I'm a BIPOC person, my primary identity is being non-white marginalized. And Keller gives this a non-complementary term. He calls this progressive victim identity. And then finally, thirdly, he suggests that Christian nationalism is another identity. And this fuses being a Christian with being a white American. These folks tend to be opposed to immigration and Muslims, and they ha are active in right-wing politics. Each of these, Keller says, are identity heresies that destructively express less than the full truth of scripture. Do any sound familiar to you? Do you find yourself going down any of these roads? Well, I'd like to suggest this morning that in our search for identity and meaning, the scriptures offer us our true identity as citizens of heaven. And the, as citizens of heaven, there are three qualities of the one that we serve. First, God is our king and he's on his throne. In the Old and New Testament, there are images of God that call him a rock, a warrior, a peacemaker, a builder, a father. And he's often seen as well as a king on his throne. When I think of kings, I often go to the British monarchy. And we've all been following it, right? Harry and William, you know, the brothers, they're having issues. And we just saw Prince Philip's um, funeral with that custom Land Rover. Um, but we all know as well that earthly reigns have their ups and downs, and they end. But in contrast, God the King's rule and reign extends forever over all time and all generations. Moses wrote in Exodus 15, 18, the Lord will reign forever and ever. He rules over heaven and earth. He's the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords, we read in Revelations. God is our creator and king who rules over a kingdom that is populated by a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, called out of darkness into his wonderful light. This is our king, our leader, our sovereign. The scriptures call us, those who are the subjects, he call, the scriptures call us sojourners, pilgrims, exiles, outsiders. And there's an old gospel song, and some of you may have been uh, able to hear it. This world is not my home, we're just a passing through. Charles Spurgeon wrote, if our citizenship is in heaven, then we are aliens here. We are strangers and foreigners, pilgrims and sojourners in the earth as our fathers were. So based on these descriptions of how we're supposed to live on earth, let me ask you a question. Do your lives, does my life look more like we are citizens of heaven or does it look more like we're a citizen of earth? And more, import more pointedly, are the values in my life more about Jesus or more about being an American? Well, as Americans, we're famous for our individualism, 
for our materialism, for our sense of personal rights and property. Are these the values you and I have? Are these the things that preoccupy our lives? Is this what you hope to gain when you grow up and graduate from this place? Do these American cultural values trump the biblical values of service, of sacrifice, caring for the vulnerable, loving our neighbors, and sharing of your time and things? Bill mentioned that I worked with students for several decades, and one of the schools I worked with was the University of Chicago. There was a very brilliant physics major involved in the Christian fellowship there. This guy was named Mark. We would call him Scary Smart. He was so good that he actually got joy in helping his friends with their problem sets. He often left his dorm room open at night so people could come in and he would just stay up with them and help them work on their problem sets. And drop by visitors got to know that if you came by, he'd help you, he could teach you how to do this, and he was okay to chat with. One of these guys who came by, was re he really sucked at physics, and he kept coming through for help. And over time, Mark got to know this man, and he, he had the opportunity to introduce him to Jesus. The Christian Fellowship at the University of Chicago in those days had a pretty amazing reputation. It got known as a group of people who were willing to help you with your academic studies. This was an amazing reputation to have in a highly competitive academic environment. What do you want to be known for? What do you want to be known for? Do you want to be known for kingdom things like doing good deeds or living good lives like in 1 Peter 2? Or do you want to be in camo or dark mode, indistinct from the culture around us? Remember, Jesus rules and he reigns forever. He's our king and our values should reflect his values. And secondly, our citizenship is in heaven. As citizens of heaven, God is the one we trust full stop. Sometimes we tend to trust in things that give us the illusion of power or control. Like if we can only control the seven mountains of society, or if we can gain dominance in this or that political party, we can bring about God's kingdom on earth and we can hasten Jesus' return. But we're warned in the scriptures several times about trusting in the wrong things. We're not to trust in more power or armaments or technology. Psalm 20 says, some nations boast of their chariots and horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. Sometimes we're tempted to, to trust in powerful people. And the psalmist says again, don't put your confidence in the powerful people. There is no help for you there. God alone is the one that we can put our trust in. People will always let us down friends, family, politics, community organizing, social justice campaigns, ultimately in and of themselves, these cannot fix the totality of our world's problems. But don't get me wrong, God can and does use these things, and together we can make a difference in meeting some of the world's great needs. When people turn to Christ, they find new life, they find hope, and they find meaning. And all of this is possible this side of heaven. And so that's why I'm so committed to the world mission of God's church, because I've seen God change lives, and I've seen families and communities and societies change because of committed Christians living out the gospel. But ultimately, remember, friends, God is the one we, we trust, not our intelligence, not our entrepreneurial life-changing, for the good of the world, innovative product or idea that gets boosted in Shark Tank, not even a political party platform. God is the one we trust. We must join him in his work. God is king, he's the one we trust. And thirdly and finally, we are citizens, citizens of heaven know that God is still sovereign over all things. Isaiah 46, nine reads, remember the things I've done in the past for I alone am God. I am God, there is none like me. Only I can tell the future before it happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. And then listen to Daniel 2.20, as God's control over all things is reaffirmed. Praise the name of our God forever and ever, for he has wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. God is the one who changes the times and seasons. God puts in place kings and rulers, gives wisdom to the wise. 
He is sovereign in heaven and earth. So I'll state the obvious. We're in the middle of a pandemic and it's hard to gain perspective. What we will know about ourselves in a pandemic individually as a nation or as a global community is probably gonna occupy the PhD dissertations of scholars for many millennia after us. But right now, it's way too close. We can't quite understand the big picture. We live in the weeds. We're trying to manage every day. Like, can I meet with my friends? Can we go to the beach? How about attend a concert or go to a Red Sox game? Can I hang around with my little kid friends? Is it ever gonna be safe again to travel? And if I'm an international student, when will it be safe for me to ever go home again and see my family? So similarly, it's hard to fully understand God's sovereignty in our lives because we're living our lives. But as Christ's followers, we believe God reigns over all, even in a pandemic. He's sovereign, he knows what he's doing. He's active in our world, even though we may not see it or understand it fully quite yet. It takes faith to affirm that God is king, that he's trustworthy, that he's sovereign over all things in heaven and on earth. And so can you, can you have faith today and rest in his sovereign control in your life, in your future, and the world that you will one day graduate from this great place to, to serve? Remember, we're born only with one kind of citizenship. We get a passport, it says we're a citizen of China, of America, of Russia, of Canada. It's a nation state. But when you and I decide to follow Jesus, we forfeit this original citizenship, or perhaps it's more accurate to say that we deeply subsume this original citizenship in order to fully embrace being citizens of heaven, belonging to God's eternal kingdom. In some ways, our posture or attitude to the world today should be a bit like my mother's was as a resident alien. We live here, we got permission to be here, we're legal residents of the planet Earth. But at the end of the day, this is not the complete, picture, the complete picture. As beautiful as the North Shore is, this is not the complete picture. The fuller, multidimensional picture of our, and our more true spiritual status is that we're kingdom citizens, citizens of, a, of heaven who serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When we gain this full-fledged citizenship, we gain belonging and protection. We also take on responsibilities. And following our king means we follow the dictates and the rules of his kingdom. Citizens of heaven will look more like Jesus and less like the world we live in. So for us today, what does it mean to be a citizen of heaven? We're to make his name known among the nations. That's what it means to be a citizen of heaven. We're to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's what it means to be a citizen of heaven. We're to make disciples of the whole earth. That's what it means to be a citizen of heaven. And our job is to make God's name great. It's not our job to make our country or our nation state great. It's God's name that we want to make great. So if we live radical lives, lives worthy of the gospel to which we've been called, get ready. Get ready to hear our king say to you and me and countless others around the globe who are citizens of heaven, one day he's going to look us in the eye and he's going to say, welcome home. Welcome home. Please join with me as I pray. Thank you, God and King, for welcoming me as a citizen of your kingdom. Thank you for receiving me into citizenship, not all by myself, but as one of many fellow citizens. Help me, Lord, to live fully as a fellow citizen. And Lord, give me the perspective shift I need to remember that I'm a citizen of heaven. Remind me continually, Lord, of your truth and majesty. Help me to conduct myself in a manner worthy of the gospel, not on my own strength, but through yours. Thank you for the beauty of the earth and the joy you give me through my family, friends, purpose, and accomplishments. But never let me forget that all of this is temporary. 
creator of all things. I so earnestly desire to be more like you, but, in my, but my humanity gets in my way. Forgive me for putting too much stock in earthly treasures, relationships, and status. And thank you for the forgiveness you offer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks for paying attention. You can head off to some hot chocolate, get warm.